and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our fifth episode, our guest is Matt Alano Martin. Matt is a stand-up comedian who comes to comedy from the world of rock and roll, where he spent 10 years touring North America as a member of several unknown bands and as a tour manager for much more successful, well-known bands. With a comedic style that bridges the social and political views of his indie rock background with the attitude and sensibilities of his rural and blue-collar youth, Alana Martin has appeared at comedy clubs, theaters, punk rock dives, redneck roadhouses, casinos, colleges, living rooms, and everywhere in between. Alano Martin's debut album, profiled as such, can be heard on the Sirius XM Raw Dog Comedy Channel, and he has appeared on the nationally syndicated The Bob and Tom Show, laughs on Fox TV, and at several festivals and prominent showcases around the country. He is also the co-founder of the Limestone Comedy Festival, which runs from June 2nd to 4th, 2016, in Bloomington, Indiana, and the Arch City Comedy Festival, which runs from August 25th to 27th, 2016, in Columbus, Ohio, and is the host of Strangers on This Road podcast. He has worked for Funny Business Agency, Comedy Zone, Tribble Run, and many clubs around the country. You can find Matt's official website at mat-alano-martin.com. And you can follow him on Twitter at Matt Alano Martin, all one word. The official website for the Limestone Comedy Festival is limestonefest.com. Their Twitter page is Limestone Fest, and their Facebook page is Limestone Comedy Festival, all one word. The official website for the Arch City Comedy Festival is www.archcitycomedyfestival.com. Their Twitter page is Arch City CF, and their Facebook page is Arch City Comedy Festival, all one word. You can listen to the Strangers on This Road podcast at s o t r dot podomatic dot com. Thank you to everyone who went to iTunes and subscribed to, rated, and reviewed the Rob Burgess Show. The initial results are in, and the average rating so far is five out of five stars. It doesn't get any better than that. If you haven't subscribed to, rated, and reviewed the podcast on iTunes yet, please do so now, so we can keep the momentum going. Every little bit helps the podcast to reach an even wider audience. You can find it at tinyurl.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. And once you're signed into iTunes, hit subscribe. Click the tab on the iTunes page near the top that says Ratings and Reviews. From there, please leave a star rating, hopefully five stars, and click Write a Review to leave a review. Thanks again for the support. This week I also had a question from an Android user asking how they could subscribe to the podcast. So you can now find The Rob Berger Show on Stitcher at www.stitcher.com forward slash podcast forward slash the dash Rob dash Burgess dash show. Google Play Music at tinyurl.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show Google Play, all one word, and tune in at tinyurl.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show, tune in, all one word. You can also subscribe directly to the RSS feed at tinyurl.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show RSS. If you're an Android user and you're still not sure how to listen, you can also visit the website Subscribe on Android.com forward slash tinyurl.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show RSS. And if you have a one click supported app on your Android device, the app should load automatically. At this point, the Rob Burgess Show should be listed on most of the major podcast directories, but if you're still having trouble finding it or know of a directory I've missed, please let me know. You can find more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. 
The official website for The Rob Burgess Show is www.therobburgessshow.com. Follow on Twitter at Rob Burgess Show. Like the page on Facebook at The Rob Burgess Show. Follow on SoundCloud at the dash Rob dash Burgess dash show. The email for the show is the Rob Burgess show at gmail.com. And now on to the show. Hello. Hey Matt, it's Rob. Hey Rob, how are you? Good, how are you? All right, I guess. Good, good. Did you have time to talk right now? Uh, yep, I have it on my calendar. I'm ready to go. Sweet. Awesome. Uh, well, I guess just to start with here, go ahead and just let people know who you are and all that. Okay. Uh, I am Matt Alano Martin. I am a uh, comedian and also the co-producer of the Limestone Comedy Festival in Bloomington, Indiana. It's pretty much it. I'm, oh. I'm very two-dimensional. Those are the two things that I am. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so are you from uh, Bloomington area? No, I'm from Borden, Indiana, which is uh, down south about uh, 40 minutes north of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and so I've been in Bloomington, though, since 1999. Mm, okay. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I read this somewhere. You were a musician at one point, singer-songwriter, is that correct? I was, yeah. I played in bands uh, basically from about the age of 17 until 35 or so with varying levels of success and all kinds of different genres of music and things over the years. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, so what kind of propelled you from one, from that path to the path you're on now? You know, as far as performing comedy, I'd always been a huge comedy nerd and, and loved it growing up, but, you know, there wasn't... There wasn't an obvious path to comedy as a kid like there was with music. You know, you had music classes at school. There was a guitar shop, you know, uh, that you could, you know, have your you know, mom, you know, pester your mom into taking you to. You know, there was nothing really like that for comedy. So I just naturally followed the music instinct because that was a more clearly defined path uh, at that time. But I've always been, you know, super into comedy. And then uh, the Comedy Attic opened in Bloomington here. I guess almost seven years ago now, and or eight years ago, I guess. That became the first sort of opportunity then where it seemed feasible and real. And I'd gone to comedy shows and comedy clubs later on as an adult when I was still playing music. It just kind of happened at the right time. I was, I was getting a little burnout of playing music and, and having that be my main um, artistic endeavor. And so uh, it just was uh, kind of good timing, I guess. And so I, uh, I put out the guitar and started exploring this other interest of mine. Okay. Uh, yeah. What crossovers as far as, you know, obviously they're both performing on stage, but I feel like when you have an instrument in front of you, there is a little bit of a barrier between you and the audience. You can kind of set yourself back from, you know, yourself and the music you're playing and, and the audience. But I just feel like stand-up comedy is so just you and the microphone and against the world, basically. So what what are the parallels and what are the differences between the two types of performance, do you think? Well, I think you kind of nailed it right there. I mean, you know, you know, I played in all these different types of bands and had all these different types of experiences, you know, and there are certain elements of it that I really miss. Like I do miss a certain amount of the, you know, sort of group effort. And then, you know, particularly when you're in a touring band, it's like you're, you know, it's like it's a group of you and your best friends against the world, which you don't have that with comedy. You know, even though you have comedian friends, uh, when you're on the road doing comedy, it's a fairly lonely existence. As far as the performance aspect of it, you know, I was very comfortable on stage from the get-go because I had been performing on stage for so long. But you're right, you know, with, even if you're just doing a singer-songwriter thing, which is what I was doing at the end, so it was just me and an acoustic guitar for the most part, um, there, it's much more intimate than, say, a punk rock band. Uh, you know, well, I don't want to say that. There's a different type of intimacy, uh, actually, with that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's still a situation where, you know, they're going to listen to your three-minute-long song, and then they're going to either politely clap afterwards, or they're not going to clap, or they're going to really, really clap and, and woo or whatever. But with comedy, it's 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 constant. There's a constant give and take. There's a just a constant communication that's happening, second to second. And so that was a very intoxicating part of it. When I you know when I started doing comedy, 
I was terrified <laughs> on stage again for the first time, you know, in years because performing music had become so second nature to me mm -hmm. and performing in front of people. But comedy kind of brought back that, the terror, <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, honestly what I was looking for because music had gotten, even switching up genres and doing different things, music had gotten a little... I don't want to say boring, but I, I guess, well, no, I guess boring would be it. I just, it, it wasn't um, as intoxicating as it had been, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, f for a long time. You know, it kind of, for a while there towards the end, it was just kind of something I did because that's what I did and, you know, and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the drug, you mm -hmm. know, that it used to be, I guess. Right. What, uh, what was your first time on stage like? What, what was your first experience as a comedian not performing music? Was it a good experience or did you have to fight your way through it? You know, I honestly, I don't remember it that much. I, I kind of had an out of body experience. I mean, I distinctly remember the evening, but the actual on stage part of it, I, I kind of, um, I blacked out in a way, you know, in, a, in like a weird way. I was really so nervous and so terrified. I got laughs in that way that I think most people do. You know, I packed the audience full of my friends who couldn't believe that I was doing stand-up. And so they're, you know, very supportive. And, and I had a couple of good jokes, a couple of jokes from that first five-minute open mic set, you know, where I worked on them and developed it for a few years, you know, wound up on my first album. So just, you know, I, it wasn't like I was terrible, but, you know, I did okay the first mm -hmm. time. And, and then I went on to be terrible for a long time after that, which really is what seems to happen with comedy. You know, mm -hmm. like when that very first time, it's such a novelty to your friends that generally most people do very, very well their very first time because their friends are like, oh, my God, I can't believe they're doing stand-up, and this is just so hilarious that they are to begin with. But then once that goes away, once you start performing for strangers or your friends have gotten their head around the idea that you're up there doing that and that you're supposed to be funny, that's when you start to have to really earn it, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, so. right. Have you gone back to play the guitar here since you've been a comedian, and, and how has that experience been now that you've shifted to this other type of performance? You know, I did one show since I quote unquote retired. I, didn't, I never like officially retired. I didn't, you know, Kanye it or anything, <laughs> make a big announcement on Twitter uh, about my intentions. I did play one show uh, opening for my friends, Oh Death. They were coming through uh, Bloomington, and they asked me if I would open. And, you know, I, at that point, I had not played out music probably in a couple of years. I hadn't even really touched my guitar in a year. Um, and so that sounded like I really liked that band, and I was flattered that they asked. So I was able to work something up with my friend Matt Armstrong from Murder by Death. Uh, where he was sort of accompanying me and then, you know, so that was fun in a way to relearn it all, you know, and, and, and to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a different thing, but you know, I, I definitely comedy seems to be, uh, seems to be a more natural fit for me. You know, uh, I, I was more successful in comedy much quicker than I ever was in, in music. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Now, I know some comedians open for bands sometimes. Have you ever done that since you've been a comedian? You know, I've done some sort of mixed variety shows, which are usually, you know, like a benefit or something like that, where there'll be comedy and music together. I've definitely done those sort of things. Um, I've never gone out on tour and opened for a band. I've talked to a few of my old band friends about doing it, and it's definitely something that I would be interested in doing. But as far as, yeah, just straight up opening, you know, like, you know, with Paul Provenza opening for Diana Ross at Madison Square Garden. No, I've, I've not done that in any in any context whatsoever. But, yeah, I'm trying to think of it. I, you know, I, I definitely, like, in a weird way, my first stand-up set ever, very unofficially, was actually at a music showcase at South by Southwest. Um, I was on the Lucero family uh, picnic afternoon show, and I was the very first person. And so it was like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, which is a weird time for even to be listening to music, let alone jokes. And I just, I can't remember if there was a technical difficulty. I think it was a technical difficulty with the bass, the, the guy who was playing bass with me or something. And so I had to fill a bunch of time. And so I wound up just kind of riffing and, and sort of did a stand-up set more than I did a musical set that night, mm -hmm. or that afternoon, I should say. So that was maybe my first 
unofficial time doing stand-up on stage. Right, yeah. It seems like one of those ideas that could go really well or really poorly, depending on the crowd and depending on the music act you were paired with. Um, I know certain comedians, like I think David Cross, didn't he do something with the Strokes at one point, or maybe I'm remembering that wrong, or I don't know, but it seems like they, you know, there's probably a lot of crossover between, like, kind of indie rock and, and, and comedians, but it's like, you know, you've got people in the audience who didn't necessarily expect to see a comedian, and I imagine that might be a little bit weird weird but <laughs> yeah and that's actually the challenge that i want to do you know that's kind of one of the reasons i want to do it is for that very reason that you just said because it is it is a very different animal like the couple times i've done these sort of variety shows i mean it's everything else everything is set up for it to be a music concert you mm-hmm. know but they're just having me do comedy on there too in between bands or whatever you know and so you have people that are all standing around instead of sitting down in a quiet comedy club scenario and things like that so uh that challenge is actually what i'm looking for but yeah i know that uh eugene merman did a lot of stuff early on in his career opening for bands uh, even kind of like late into his career he was like going out and opening for i believe the shens you know it goes it goes both ways my friend sean who uh, is more commonly known in the world of, of music as langhorn swim which is sort of known to like he plays under um, he got his start actually the other way around. He's a musician, but he started off opening up for Eugene Merman and other comedians out of New York who wanted a musical act. So it goes both ways. I mean, I think there is a, a correlation there. And then, of course, Big J. Okerson uh, sort of famously was the only comedian on OzFest tour. <laughs> For some reason, they had one comedian, and he was on the main stage, and he would come out, and and he's the perfect guy for it. I mean, he's a he's a huge metalhead, and mm-hmm. fits into that scene really well. But it's still like, you know, you're talking about Ozfest as like this weird outdoor festival. So I mean, it's already there's so many things that are a bad idea for doing comedy like outdoors on a giant stadium stage, things like that. Right. But uh, but he made it work. He totally, you know, he pulled it off. Well, uh, I was going to ask you about this, too, and I don't know how much this relates to your backstory, but I did see that you did a one-man show at one point. Is that correct? Yeah, I did the Indie French Festival two different years. So I actually did, a tw- I did two different one-man shows, which the first one it was I wanted to do an hour that wasn't necessarily all con- con- you know, strictly stand-up. You know, there was a- an element of it that was more serious or more heartfelt. It definitely was still funny overall, you know. More, but it was it was a way for me to kind of stretch my uh, my legs uh, creatively as a as sort of as a comedian slash storyteller. And then the second one, I really just tried to make it like an hour of stand up that had a theme running through it. So it was I was definitely shooting for it to be, and a lot of that is is going to be what is. Is going to be my second album. When uh, like the biggest chunk of that, the sort of theme and what I developed for that show is is a lot of what I'm doing on stage now. Um, but it was still with this idea that it wasn't just 45 minutes to an hour of jokes. It was 45 minutes to an hour of jokes that were joke, 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 joke. There was never a serious, like heartfelt, like heavy section of it. But all the jokes are sort of building to. Not a central argument, but a central sort of theme and point that I was trying to make, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of where I was going with that question, because I hear people talk about the term one-man show, and, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of like every stand-up comedy set you see is a one-man show, unless they're a comedy duo or a team or whatever, so, um, but are you, are you, are you, I guess you're probably storytelling, you're probably weaving things together, whereas a comedy fest, you know, or a comedy set, you would be, you know, just kind of maybe doing more one-liners or things that aren't necessarily connected, uh, together, um, I don't have much experience, I guess, with the, with the one-man show genre, I'm kind Kind of thinking of Spalding Gray, if, if I'm thinking of anybody, I guess, but that's more maybe just monologue. But there are. That's, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you could think of something along the lines of what Mike Birbiglia has been doing. Mm-hmm. You know, he's really been blurring the lines between traditional stand up and traditional storytelling uh, in that, or, you know, even David Sedaris coming from the other side of it. You know, Birbiglia obviously comes out of the stand up comedy world, and David Sedaris comes from the literary world, but. When you go to a David Sedaris reading, it's very, very funny. I mean, it's as funny as a stand-up show would be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but also you can think about, like, you know, Eddie Izzard is a good example, you know, of someone who would do themed hours. 
uh, you know, it's like his hour that was themed about the history of the of the world, you know. And so it's all stand up, but it's all written around this one sort of centralized theme. Um, you know, Stuart Hoff does that a lot, where he kind of puts together a theme that runs through the entire show, whether it be talking about evolution or whether it be talking about, you know, uh, human sphere of change, you know, whatever the sort of the overarching theme. That was really what I was going for uh, with the second one. Um, you know, but then on the other hand, there is a great freedom of just going into a comedy club and doing an hour of just the funniest stuff that you have and also the most current stuff, like what you want to talk about. Maybe it doesn't fit under a theme. There's, you know, that's, it's, it's nice to be able to have it both ways, really, mm-hmm. you know? Right. And you mentioned Eddie Izzard, and I, I do think he probably lends himself to that style a little bit more because he's such a physical comedian. And I feel like there's a lot of like mime work that he kind of does, like a lot of physical, like, like <laughs> you can listen to the set or whatever, but you'll be missing about 45% of what's happening because he does so much, you know, mugging and, you know, he does so much work with his body and it is kind of like a mime you know influence there so i think that kind of long form storytelling thing definitely fits with his style better so but anyway that wasn't really a question okay. but uh oh no that's okay no i i concur you're yeah, right, okay. you're right very right. good at selling his material you're yeah right. and also i don't know if you saw this i think i pulled this pulled his name because i just just read this recently that he just ran 27 marathons in 27 days did you see that yes i did see that what was that about i just read the headline i didn't really He's explore doing it charity he's okay. doing it for a charitable thing and uh-huh. then also just to prove that he is a superhuman being i think yeah i know he does these things where it's like are you okay you win you know because like i remember when he was doing his uh, dress to kill set i remember there was a dvd extra on that dvd where he did the same set in french in france jo- yeah. I, he's like doing joke it's like okay i get it you're amazing like i laughed at this in english i assume this is funny in french i don't speak french i'm very impressed that you're doing this like you win you know like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, 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 real. Now, think about that as if you were also if you were another comedian. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like if if we're gonna have to do this podcast interview in French after this, no. I mean, I think we're both gonna be in trouble. I don't think either one of us is gonna be able to hang. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean. Yeah. So. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, kind of moving to the, you know, comedy festival part of your, your resume, um, I guess just maybe talk about the Comedy Attic a little more and, and how you became affiliated with them and, and kind of the genesis of the comedy festival. And, you know, you, it's one thing to be a comedian on your own, and it's other, another to be an administrator like that. So kind of just bring us through that yeah. process. Yes, I like to be referred to as an administrator. <laughs> a facilitator. That's the, sexiest, that's the sexiest of all titles. Uh <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, well, the Comedy Attic is my home club, and like I said, that's where I, I started doing stand-up. And I didn't actually go do stand-up there until they had been open for a year. Um, and it was not out of lack of interest. I think it was just timing of it. Uh, I was actually – I'd actually worked with Jared Thompson, the owner of the, the, uh, the Comedy Attic, uh, years prior. Uh, we both worked at the cable company together, and we both – came out of this same similar sort of music background. Um, he did it in uh, Louisiana where he grew up. He was a show promoter for all these punk rock hmm. shows. And so once we kind of found that out about each other, we were like friends at work. We would, you know, chit chat, even though we worked in different departments. And so, you know, I knew Jared and I knew his wife and, and I was very proud of them that they launched their own business and stuff. But for some reason that first year, I just never made it out to the club. Uh, and I wound up going on the finals of their annual, their first annual contest. They have a contest every summer of like local comedians. And uh, so my wife and I went to that. And I, I'm glad that that was the first show that I went to because it really, they were, there was three really, really funny guys uh, clearly because it was the finals, but they were not, they were still amateurs. They weren't so amazing that it seemed unreachable. Mm-hmm. Like if I'd gone to see, and I'd gone to see stand up before that, you know, I'd seen, you know, Mark Curry and, you know, before I moved to Bloomington, when I lived in Evansville, I used to go to the, the comedy club there. And so I'd seen Jake Johansson and, you know, some really amazing comedians. But going and seeing this finals of the amateur contest, it was not so out of reach. It didn't seem like an otherworldly thing like it would have been if I'd gone to see Carlin or somebody. And so because it wasn't, it was good, but it wasn't so unbelievably good, there was a a moment where I thought, oh, I could do that. Not like, oh, I'm better than these guys, but it was just, oh, 
normal human beings can do this. We just talked about how, like, otherworldly, you know, Eddie Izzard is, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, these were just normal dudes out there being funny. So, you know, I then, you know, open mics and worked my way up through the ranks at the Comedy Attic, and at the same time I was going out on the road and doing other things, other clubs, other open mics, other independent shows all over the Midwest. And I started to get into a few festivals, and uh, they were not great. Uh, you know, there were things about them that were good, but there was a lot of stuff about the festivals that I was getting into that I didn't like, um, particularly how they treated the non-famous comedians. The, non, the non-famous comedians who got in were just sort of shoved off into a corner somewhere, and there was never – there wasn't much promotion for their shows. There was no reason for them to be uh, – anyone to come see their show because across the street was Anthony Jeselnik or, or somebody super famous. And so – I just came back from one of those festivals and pitched the idea of Limestone to Jared. I uh, just kind of worked it out of my brain, like the way that it would work. And I just kind of took a pretty fleshed out version of what the festival would be. And I also, you know, have a background in tour managing uh, bands, which I got into from when I was playing in bands. Uh, I was always the responsible adult in my band. I wound up transitioning from that into working for more successful touring bands uh, as a tour manager. So I had event production, you know, experience, and also I'd had a day job years earlier of being an event coordinator for the Chamber of Commerce. So all of the sort of logistical, boring administrator stuff, as you put it, is stuff that I had done, you know, and things that I understood how to do for a live event. And so, you know, a couple of people had talked to Jerry before about doing a festival, but I think they had just basically said, hey, we should do a comedy festival and had no sort of pitch to him, no no sort of structure or anything, which, you know, he very accurately surmised was them saying, hey, you should do a comedy festival, uh, which he didn't really have time to, to do because he was running a club. So I think because mine was a little bit more put together, he signed on with the idea, you know, we became partners, equal partners in the festival, and we just kind of launched it from there. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I definitely think we need to emphasize how respected the Comedy Attic is uh, in the comedy community, Um, because before I even knew about the Limestone Comedy Festival, I knew about the Comedy Attic, and not because I, you know, I was born in Bloomington or I went to school at IU. I just, I'm a fan of comedy, and I knew that that was one of the most highly respected clubs in the country. So uh, maybe just talk a little bit about why that is and and what the reputation of the club is kind of around the country here. Yeah, and that's also one of the main parts of, well, I'll I'll, I'll answer that here in a second, but I, I should also back up. I'm glad you brought that up because it actually is, it actually is one of the reasons that I knew the festival would work. It wasn't just that I knew how to put together an event budget and how to structure this thing. It was also realizing the Comedy Attic had this sterling reputation nationwide for comedy, not with just comedy fans, but also with comedians themselves and also people in the industry. Uh, and so that's how I knew that the festival would work. Is, is the Attic was on board with it, it had immediate legitimacy, you know, as being a serious thing that people wanted to be a part of. Uh, the way that Jared and Dana built that reputation is literally from scratch. I mean, everything about the comedy attic should not work. You know, it's a weird L-shaped building, like room that you sit in for the comedy. It's too small for the the size headliners that they bring in. You know, all these things that other club owners, when they find out I'm from Bloomington, they ask me, like, how does he do that? How does he bring in Mark Marin and, and Maria Bamford and all these people when he only has 160 seats? And the thing is that Jared was just very... He's very smart about comedy and comedy trends and what people actually want. And when the Comedy Attic opened, almost no one in the Midwest was booking those people. Most of the comedy clubs in the Midwest were still booking people that were from a former generation of comedy or, you know, there were a few bright spots here and there, but no one was really keying in on how big Pete Holmes was getting. You know, no one was keying in on the cultural importance of Mark Marin because WTF had not really blown up yet. You know, he didn't certainly have his TV show. People thought, a lot of people thought of Mark Marin as that guy from the 90s, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't realize in the way that Jared realized the importance of 
of Mark or of Janine Garofalo or of Emo Phillips, all these people that sort of launched an entire genre of comedy who were still working and are still amazing and still doing new stuff, but they weren't, they were maybe not in favor mm-hmm. as much with the, with the most clubs. You know, he just really saw where comedy was going and was keyed into it in a way that most clubs in the Midwest were not. Since the success of the Comedy Attic, you see a lot of these other Midwestern clubs now following his lead. That's definitely something you see is people like Bobcat Goldthwait, who Jared would bring in, and nobody was working in the Midwest, really. Once they see that he's doing the Attic, then they're like, oh. And then they do their research, or they start to realize, oh, he's incredibly relevant. He's incredibly funny. People will come see him. You know, I think it's just a lot of clubs didn't understand um, how strong the the comedy nerd scene had become. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this rising tide of comedy super fans that are incredibly connected now due to the podcast the popularity of podcasts like You Made It Weird and WTF and Comedy Bang Bang and Never Not Funny, you know, and obviously the Rob Burgess podcast is right up there. Uh, sure. So, yeah. <laughs> um, or will be soon enough. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so I, I think Jared was just plugged in in a way that those other people were not, you know. And so that plus the fact that they just, they treat the comedians great, from all levels, you know, from MC to headliner, they have a real loyalty there, which is why now that Marin has done very well for himself again and kind of had the second coming of his career, and, you know, Maria has continued to, to rise, and, you know, Nikki Glazer and Pete Holmes, all these people that Jared was looking either when they're sort of in a, in a lull in their career or, you know, before they were big, keep coming back to the the attic is because of it's it's there's a, there's a sort of a shared loyalty there, but then also they've just done everything they could to educate its audience on what is good comedy mm-hmm. and what is good comedy etiquette. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't sell shots. They don't encourage birthdays, and they don't encourage uh, bachelorette parties. Like, if you're coming to this show to watch comedy. You're not coming to the show to get wasted on cheap liquor. I mean, they have liquor, and they have mm-hmm. beer, and they have wine, and they have food, and they have all the things that a comedy club does. But the focus is not on those things. The focus right. isn't on, you know, Jaeger shots on specials. That you, that's just not ever going to happen there because they understand that that just creates – well, why do you need why do you need a show when you have Jaeger shots? That is a show. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I don't exactly. need any entertainment. I am the entertainment at that point. You know? Right. Well, and there's also the thing, too, of, of comedy clubs. There are a lot of comedy clubs that will feel like the audience is always right when if the audience is being disruptive to, you know, it's, it's such a short-sighted thing, too, also. Like, if I'm sitting in the audience and the table next to me is getting wasted and there being a problem, mm-hmm and the club doesn't handle that, then I, as an audience member, are probably not coming back to that place, mm-hmm. you know? Because it's like, oh, well, it's just where a bunch of drunken idiots go, and they're allowed to run wild, you know? And I just paid $25 to, to go see this comic that I really love, and I'm not really getting to see it. That's the a, that's a short sighting that the clubs that really encourage that sort of stuff. They just don't think about everyone else mm-hmm. for some reason, you know? I will say though that it is a thing of beauty when a when a gifted comedian gets a hold of a uh, disruptive audience member and just uh, body slams them verbally to the ground. Uh, there is a certain thrill in the uh, pit of your stomach you get when somebody gets what's coming to them and they just are too you know inebriated to respond in a uh, a similar manner. So there is a you know there is a certain element of of that that is satisfying. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it really doesn't help anyone to, to have that. And I'm sure those people think. Oh, I'm helping the show because I'm, yeah. I'm you know, whatever. You know? Well, yeah, there's a lot of different types of hack. Like, and the thing is also is that stuff still occasionally happens at the attic. You still can't stop it everywhere. But it really, they really have done everything they can to sort of cultivate a smart audience, not just like an, an etiquette, like how to behave in, in public, which people's parents should have taught them. But then also <laughs> just in a general thing of like of why someone – You know, of booking someone like Todd Glass, who's going to give you a very different comedy experience than maybe what you were expecting, right? This very uh, improvisational sort of breaking the the fourth wall, you know, like it's just 
they've done a really good job of, of, of letting people know it's not just like set up punchline, what's the deal with airplane food, you know? Um, and I, I do, do honestly believe that too, because you see it in other clubs, you know, I've, I've been lucky to work at some other clubs that have been great, and I work some clubs that aren't so great and haven't done this, but the audience learns, you know, and if a club is booking someone who, you know, a bunch of comedians who are stuck in the 80s or the 90s and doing what to deal with airplane food and the sort of jokes that are out of touch socially uh, with how most of the world feels about things, uh, they just learn to accept that as, oh, that's what comedy is. Mm-hmm. So it really, a club, a club owner and the way that they book can really, you know, shape an entire community's viewpoint on what comedy should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can't emphasize enough how the environment of the comedy attic influences how you take in the comedy because uh, you, you touched on this a little bit before when we were talking about musicians opening for music acts, but you know, it's it's there's an analogy to be made to live theater um, in that there's really an element that can't be recreated unless you're there. And you really have to be present to experience it fully. And the environment of the comedy attic is so intimate that, and this is one of the things, and I think I maybe learned this during the basketball riots of my freshman year at IU at 2002, but there is a real element of lack of personal responsibility when a crowd is involved and when we're just in an open air thing and we're all just doing things, you know, and nobody really has to take any personal responsibility for it. But I feel like when you're in a room that small, like the comedy attic, you really do have to take responsibility for yourself and if you're going to act out you're everyone's going to know about it and whatever experience you have you're all having it together um and i do think the intimacy is definitely part of that but i mean you're right there are these other elements but i really can't uh, overemphasize enough the low ceiling kind of crouch down everyone's kind of in it together kind of thing really does influence how you take in the comedy at the comedy attic yeah, definitely. And, it, you know, and I talk about how, you know, I said it, it shouldn't work because of the physical, you know, the, and I'm talking about just the size of it and, mm-hmm. and you know, um, and then also it is it is this kind of bizarre L-shaped room, uh, which is not, if you were drawing it up on paper, it's not what you would think would be an ideal setup um, for watching anything. But, yeah, the, the intimacy of it, they get everything else is so perfect. There's, you know, there's some magic you just can't control. You know, like some places have it and other places don't. And it definitely has that magic, you know. Like they've probably been successful enough they could have moved to a different place and got a bigger spot. But, you know, a lot of times you then you ruin everything that's working when Mm -hmm. you do that. You know, I don't want to speak out of hand for Jared, but, you know, there's there's a certain magic in that room. And you're right. It's a lot of just, you know being the fact that you're almost sitting on top of the performer sometimes, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, you guys are in your, is this the fourth year? I'm, I'm losing track here. Is this? This is the fourth year, wow. yeah. Festival. Okay. Yeah, and I talked to Jared a little bit about uh, the performers you have coming in here. Um, and you guys are really uh, keen on, you mentioned this before, on breaking talent or reminding people of talent. And kind of, you were talking a little bit about before, like, you know, these people that started these comedy revolutions in the past and, and the entertainment world has kind of left them by the wayside for the new shiny object of whatever is hot this year, but... Uh, I, I think it's a little harsh, but okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You don't have to take <laughs> yeah. responsibility for that statement. I'll, I'll put that yeah, on me. I, yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm thinking I of a... Uh, a like I, I, When you said that, I thought of a Terry Gross interview I heard once with Rick Rubin, where he was talking about when he started working with Johnny Cash on the American series. Um, and he was just talking about how you know our society is so ready to discard things Things, whether they have value or not, just because they're the not not the newest shiniest thing on the block. Whereas right. you know, he sat him down with a acoustic guitar in a studio and a recorder, and that was it. And they made you know those albums. We all know how that turned out. So you know, I feel like a lot of things like that. And like when I went to see Emo Phillips, I'd never seen Emo Phillips live. Of course, I'd seen him on Doctor Cats and you know UHF and everything else that everybody'd seen him on. But he's just killing it. Like and just I just couldn't believe. How how hard I was laughing, and I really think you guys are very keen
keen at recognizing talent for talent's sake and you know once people get a load of who you bring in it's like we trust your opinion because you've brought this other experiences um, and kind of where I was going with that is you know this year I'd say I recognize the performers of it a little less than I do outside of Bobcat Goldplay of course but um, but he was kind of telling me about you know there's there's this person that's going to do this and you know I trust that opinion because I know in the past I haven't been disappointed yet I mean there's been plenty of people you guys have brought to the comedy festival that I had no idea of before that I'm just huge fans of now because I know the reputation of the uh, selection I guess you could say so Oh, well, that's very, very nice of you to say, and that is certainly something that we uh, we take seriously. You know, we know that from year one, we knew that word of mouth and, and, and the customer service that we give and how good the festival is and how well we treat the attendees and the comedians and the sponsors and, you know, everyone involved, the volunteers, um, is what makes or breaks a festival. You know, um, it's like we, it really is all about our reputation. And, yeah, we, we work really hard to keep the lineup fresh um, and then to do a mix of things. You know, um, I'm so glad that you mentioned Emo because I had not seen Emo do stand-up comedy, and I saw him in all the same ways that you had referred to him, like from UHF and from Dr. Katz, and I knew who he was. And uh, he was a part of my childhood, and I probably saw some of his stand-up as a kid. Um, but it's the same thing when Jared brought him to the Comedy Attic for one of their anniversary weekends. I went thinking, oh, well, this will be nice. You know, it's like, oh, it's the old timer guy and it's going to be cute. And he blew me out of, he blew me away. And it was right then was like, oh, well, we got to have him on my stone next year. I mean, I just, I think I just went immediately to Jared's office like, well, we got to have that, you know. Uh, and Jared is so good at that. I mean, not just the new people, but then also knowing, again, you know, who still got it and, and who, we need to have, there's a certain historical context to it as well. It's something we try to do with the festival every year is we try to have someone that we can genuinely present as the legendary. And I think we started that with Emo with year two, where we put him up as, we build him as the legendary Emo Phillips. You know, and that was, you know, the same year that we had Patton Oswalt, who is by far a legend, you know, and everybody knows. But we didn't call him the legendary Patton Oswalt. You know, because... I mean, you don't really need to. <laughs> it's kind of implied. You don't need to, but it's also, it's also a sort of thing that, you know, yeah, everybody knows who Patton is. And then also, what was so great is Patton completely embraced our love of emo, and he was tweeting about it, about how excited mm-hmm. he was to be on. And that's... Because here, here's someone who influenced him, you know? Mm-hmm. And so we try every year to have one of these people that was really either... Well, I don't think any of them were doing it knowingly, but anyone who was part of the birth of, you know, whatever you want to call it, alternative comedy or whatever, you know, um, the 90s comedy, the sort of the the rebirth after the 80s boom, we try to bring at least one of those people every year. This year, it's definitely, it's, it's Bobcat, although obviously Bobcat's done a lot in the past couple of years from directing films. You know, uh, his most recent one, Call Me Lucky, is, you know, an award-winning documentary. Uh, you know, he's, he never went away. People just didn't really know he was around. He went behind the camera a lot on a lot of things. Uh, and he continued to do stand-up the entire time, too. But, yeah, anytime we could bring, you know, someone like that or Janine or, you know, you know, emo, we're going to do that because there is an entire younger generation who doesn't know about these people, you know, and they need to know. Mm-hmm. You know? And then at the same hand, we're trying to always bring new people that are, you know, maybe not on everyone's radar yet, you know? Mm-hmm. Right, right, definitely. And if people haven't seen Call Me Lucky, I watched it just the other week and can't say enough good things about it. It's a hard movie to watch, especially during the last, uh, you know, half of that movie, but yeah. um, it is pretty amazing. And he does use a lot of cinematic tactics to tell a true story. Um, and, you know, I, like you mentioned a little bit, he's done some directing. I know he directed one of Patton's specials and he's directed a couple other movies uh, as well. Didn't he, didn't he direct a, that? 
Robin Williams movie? Am I? Thinking yeah, he directed World's Greatest Dad yeah. uh, with Robin Williams. He directed mm-hmm. uh, God Bless America, which I think is a genius film, particularly for like the sort of brilliant performance that Joel Murray gives in the lead. I mean, it's it's an incredible film just to watch for mm-hmm. his performance. Uh, yeah, so he's been around. He's been doing stuff, you know, and he also was uh, the director of the Jimmy Kimmel Show uh, for several years. People don't people don't realize that late night talk shows have directors, but there's you know someone has to kind of steer the ship, mm-hmm. and he was doing that for several years. He's directed several episodes of Marin, so, uh, but the whole time he's still been doing stand-up, you know, and, and he's uh, just one of the, the best storytelling comedians out there to this day, because he's, he's got so many stories, and he's, and he's one of those guys that is, uh, is, is going to tell them, you know, he's not someone who's going to be overly PC about, I don't want to say not overly PC, I'm trying to think of what, like, I don't want to say, uh, how can I put this? He's been around a lot of Hollywood types, and, it's, right. and if he's got a story about him, he's going to tell him. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I, I think he's been story. through it, though. You know what I mean? He's had a persona, and, and that's always something that has amazed me that people have comic personas, is that you kind of have to keep that up all the time. And I do think that that creates a certain fortitude in yourself as far as the way you present yourself and the uh, the way that you have to have confidence in what you're saying. Because, you know, you and I can go out, and we'll, we'll be ourselves or as, as genuine to ourselves as we can, but he was for years he was the guy from police academy and i think he was that guy on stage right i mean that was that was his thing in yeah. the 80s right yeah yeah that's how he got the that's how he got the gig yeah exactly yeah. You, you have to be pretty confident in yourself to go out and be that persona and not necessarily yourself uh on stage yeah. i i can't even imagine doing that keeping that up you know all the time right yeah, I mean, there's definitely people who will do it, and they have a little bit more of a, a, a distancing between it too. If you think about uh, Greg, who is uh, the real name of uh, Neil Hamburger, the guy who mm. plays Neil Hamburger, you know, he doesn't walk around in his everyday life as Neil Hamburger, you know, <laughs> uh, you know. And, and in fact, like the minute that he comes off stage, like he's Greg again, you know, like he because he's talked about how weird it would be to try to deny that this is a, a character, you know. Um, so I, I guess people just, you know, do it differently. And I guess it's sure. depending on how much of a character it really is. But, yeah, uh, that's why I've tried from day one to not uh, have that in my stand-up. It's too much work. It's hard enough work just being me. So yeah, that's, exactly. That's all I'm trying to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, do you want to talk about any of the other um, performers you have coming for this year's uh, festival? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we're proud of all of them. Um, you know, one of the things, I don't know if Jared mentioned this in his interview with mm-hmm. you for the paper, but, sure. you know, this year we half of our headliners are women, which mm-hmm. is something we've been it, – it's – it's one of those things where it just seems like such an obvious, of course, it should be, it, it, it should, you should do that. But, you know, booking is such a weird juggling act, uh, particularly since we don't have a ton of money. You know, we have to find performers who, who kind of want to do it because they want to do it. Um, you know, we, we do pay them, but I mean, it's just, uh, it's it's a little bit harder to get people to you know uh, maybe come to Indiana than it would be too like if we were having our festival in Hawaii or something mm-hmm. right um, but yeah I'm very proud of the fact that we've you know half of our headliners this year are women uh, there's a sort of an issue in the world of comedy that's been coming to the forefront recently and and it's been an issue that's been around forever and it's it's an issue in society but you know so it's reflected in our industry but you know we're just um, females are not given a lot of credit in the mm-hmm. world of comedy, um, and they have to take a lot of crap uh, in a variety of different ways that is all really, really uh, terrible. And so we just sort of consciously decided, you know, if we can lead by example, if we can be, you know, I don't know, it's, this is a sort of a hard thing to verbalize. You know, we, we've always tried to have a very diverse lineup because we feel like that makes it for a better comedy festival. You know, we've always tried to have uh, a good representation of different races, different gender, different gender identity, different sexual identity. And this just seemed like the sort of the one thing that we were sort of missing was pushing for an actual uh, gender equality across the board as far as number of performers as well. Mm-hmm. Um now, I don't know if it's going to still work out that way with the submission comics. Um, that po- that process is happening right now with the review panel. Uh, and obviously, funny trumps everything. But as much as we can get it towards this idea of, you know, Justin Trudeau just hit the, you know, nail on the head this year. Uh, you know, Canadian Prime Minister, when he was asked why, why, is ha- why does half of his 
cabinet women and he was like well it's 2015 it's like oh right (laughs) like if you are in a position of power and you know that women are just as capable Mm -hmm. then you it's your sort of your responsibility to to give them those opportunities and to sort of reflect you know we can't talk about we want equality and then not reflect that in our own festival sure and that reminds me of a ruth bader ginsburg quote i remember she said uh you know one won't be equal on the court and you know that's when the hall of justices are women don't act like that's shocking this is you know we've never had that before it's been men 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 for years and you know if we actually want to reflect society you know we need to include more of these and it's not necessarily about you know affirmative action or giving people a benefit that they don't deserve um you know i do think that there is a terrible uh, amount of sexism as far as comedy because i think there is the idea that men are genetically engineered to try to you know the, we have to be funny we have to impress the women or whatever women don't have to be funny they can just let the men come to them and i do think that kind of regressive thought is is in a lot of people's heads and you know some of the best comedians i've seen at limestone were the women and it wasn't because i was like oh i better give these women the benefit of the doubt because they're weaker and i should probably just you know (laughs) you know it was just like these people are honestly the funniest people at the festival like you know just because they're funny and sex has nothing to do with it nor should it for the men it just like you said funny should trump everything it shouldn't be yeah yeah anything else so yeah and you know well and also like the whole like women aren't funny argument just immediately breaks down the minute you start thinking about who are some of the top women or who are the top comedians working right now. I mean, you have uh, Sarah Silverman, you know, who is semi-retired, but every time she comes out and does something, it's unbelievable, Mm -hmm. you know, and she had one of the most successful comedy shows ever on Comedy Central. You know, you have Maria Bamford, who is widely considered by everyone in comedy to be the greatest, one of the greatest living comedians. I mean, Judd Apatow won't shut up about her on on Twitter, Mm -hmm. for example, you know. Uh, You know, you have Amy Schumer. I mean, there's so many, and it's not even currently. I mean, you just think about, like, how amazing Lily Tomlin was. And, like, there's always been funny women. There just haven't always been enough opportunities for them. So this idea, like you said, this idea that that they're not funny is just, it's just bullshit. It's just not based on anything, mm-hmm. you know? And so, yeah, uh, we just, you know, we're, we're very open to the fact that, you know, it's funny comes first, but... Having a festival of 50, you know, uh, sarcastic white guys in their 20s would be the worst <laughs> festival. That would be just terrible. Nobody wants to see that, you know, not for three days, not even for an entire show. Mm-hmm. You have five of the same comedians on the same show. That's terrible, mm-hmm. right? And so that diversity, you know, it's it just needs to be reflected in, in, in the comedy and in, in the, the makeup. And, and, you know, we're just really happy that we're able to, to do that this year. And, you know, and hopefully we can do it again next year. Like I said, it all comes down to who's available, who can do the festival, who we can afford, who's good, who hasn't been there before. So there's a good chance that next year we won't have – 50% female headliners. Uh, we'll try our very best to make it happen, but um, I'm very I'm very excited that we were able to get it done this year. Sure, definitely. Um, now, I uh, noticed, and I didn't know this before I started researching for this uh, podcast here, but you're also the uh, director or co-founder or co-director of the Arch City Comedy Festival. Uh, what was the timeline as far as that with the Limestone? Did you do one first before the other? Or how did you get involved in that one? Yeah, I, uh, that's, that's only, it's coming up on its second year. So, um, you know, uh, basically I have a friend, Natalie Heflin, who is based out of Columbus, Ohio, and she is, uh, a independent promoter of comedy shows. Um, she will bring in, um, comedians and do various one night runs throughout the Midwest. And I had worked for her a few times, which is how I first met her. Uh, and then we became friends after that. And she just reached out to me with this idea of doing a festival like Limestone, uh, maybe a little bit smaller scale at first uh, in Columbus. And originally she was going to hire me to sort of be an advisor, but you know, we're friends and I know that festivals often don't make money their first year. So rather than have her be, uh, you know, another, 
expensive, uh, another expense on her, uh, or a line item expense on her budget, I would, you know, I just said, well, let's just do it together, and uh, hopefully we'll break even, which is, uh, I'm very happy to say is what happened. We, uh, I think we made $7 the first year. All right. uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah. So, it's a partnership between uh, Natalie and I, and it happens, uh, we're still kind of tweaking it. It is very much like a, a, a small baby version of Limestone. Um but, uh, you know, we've got four great headliners there this year. It's in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, it's August 25th through the 27th. This year we have uh, Ryan Singer, Al Jackson, Rhea Butcher, and Renee Gauthier. Uh, now so far we're going to be announcing a fifth headliner in the next couple of weeks. We can't really talk about it yet because it's not quite confirmed. But uh, it's, uh, it's a baby festival. It's getting up and going. But uh, last year was a lot of fun and, and a nice success, like I said, because we – we got into uh, we got into the black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Um, well, I uh, I appreciate what you guys do a lot for just the fact that you know there is a I think a bias towards trying to get comedians to move to L. A. or New York or Chicago. Um, you know, and I totally understand that because that is where the work is, and that's how people get noticed and famous. And you know, there's industry people that watch or whatever. But I do think there is an element of trying to make where you are cool. You know, it's like every Everyone wants to live somewhere cool, and we all just want to, you know, I lived in California, and that wasn't an accident that I ended up there, you know, I, I, I wanted to live in California since I was a little kid, you know, because I was like, oh, I live in southern Indiana, nothing cool ever happens here, but, you know, since I've moved back to Indiana, it's like, I respect people more who try to make where they live cool, you know, it's like, where can, what can we do to make where we're at, because there's no reason why cool has to live one place or another, it's like, you make what you can make of it, and what are you doing to improve your area, you know, and, and try to make something to, for people to do, you know, and I, I appreciate that you guys do that. Do you find that there's, uh, you know, with comedian friends of yours, uh, how, or have you ever been tempted to, you know, kind of get out of town and try to, you know, make it elsewhere where it might be easier for you, to, you know, to climb the ladder or what have you? Uh, well, I think that you uh, you hit a couple of things there right on the head. Uh, first of all, I agree. It, there is, you know, I'm also from Southern Indiana, and I and I came up in you know the independent music scene, particularly in punk rock, when I was a kid. And there really was that idea of make your own fun. You know, if you mm -hmm. grew up like because I grew up, you know, a good 45 minutes outside of Louisville in a tiny town, there was nothing to do. Well, you know, until I got my license, and even then, you know, I couldn't afford to go to Louisville all the time. I definitely still have that in me, this idea of creating. You know, a friend of mine once told me that there are two different types of people. There's creators and consumers, mm -hmm. and it's just kind of hard, hardwired into you. And there's nothing wrong with being a consumer. We need consumers. We need people who want to go out and watch live entertainment. They want to buy the music that you make or the books that you write or whatever. That's great. You know, there's people who are super into, you know, experiencing things. And then there are people that have that itch that they have to create. Um, so I definitely, I'm the same way. I, I definitely respect anybody who tries to create something in their own scene or their own city or their own state. Um, and that's certainly, you know, one of the sort of points of pride that we have with the festival is, you know, it's Limestone is probably one is in the top ten as far as comedy festivals in the nation, as far as the size of it, the influence of it, um, how important it is within the industry. Um, and there's a lot of festivals now. You know, there's a ton. Um, it makes me pretty happy that we're one of those festivals that's in the top ten and we're in the middle of Indiana. That's mm -hmm. pretty awesome, I think. Um, and then... Yeah, as far as, like, the temptation to leave or whatever, you know, I'm older. You know, I started comedy later. Uh, I'm married. My wife has a job. We own a house. I, I like actually living in Bloomington quite a bit. Um, do I think my career could be farther along personally as a comedian if I lived in one of those other cities? Maybe. I don't know. You know, who can really say? Maybe it would get uh, even extra soul-crushing, and I would have quit by now. You know, who knows? Uh, but... You just, you know, you do you do what you can. I mean, it, I think it is a tougher road if you're a comedian out of the Midwest because you are less likely to get seen by someone who has the power to put you on Conan or to put you at Just for Laughs, you know, new faces. Um, you know, that's – there's a certain, you know, just reality of that, you know. Um, but 
it's not like hopeless, you know. I mean, the nice thing about doing comedy is you really can live anywhere and do it. Um, I mean, I'm going to L.A. for four days and doing a bunch of showcases, and I've done that a couple times before for like a week at a time, um, you know, and I do the cool shows, you know, like the cool hip shows. I've, I've done the improv in Hollywood and, you know, I, I've done that stuff. I'm going to New York to do it. Uh, I mean, you know, you can go do it in these other cities. Um, you know, it's not the same as living in those cities and going up all the time and just constantly being in front of the right people who have those making decisions, but uh, it could be done, you know. The Grolix, uh, they did it from Denver, which is a collection of three comedians, and they just worked their asses off, and all are very, very funny. You know, that, again, funny trumps everything, but they also, you know, wrote their own sitcom, which then got bought by True TV, you know, uh, it's called Those Who Can't, and uh, it's getting great reviews, and they did it from Denver. Uh, of course, ironically, once True TV bought the sitcom, they all had to move to L.A. <laughs> so they could make it, but, you know, they got that break from doing it from Denver, you know, and so you could definitely don't have to be in one of the, the key areas, you know, there's obviously, you know, uh, people like Bo Burnham, who just posts videos on YouTube and become famous overnight from that, you know, um, there's a lot of different opportunities opportunities out there, uh, but I don't know, maybe this is just the in, inherent Midwestern in me, there's something about the the uphill battle of it, of doing it from the Midwest that appeals to me, or feels it's, right. I, I almost, I, I, I know exactly what you mean, because like when I was working in California, I would write things that I would think were so controversial, I'm like, oh man, I'm gonna get so much hate mail from this one, and it's just crickets, and people are like, yeah, we agree, BFD, you know, it's like, but it's like, here, I'll say something I don't even think, you know, I'll write something I don't even necessarily think is that, you know, barn-burning controversial, and it's like, people are ready to show up on my door with pitchforks and stuff and it's like, well, you know, I'm not going to get as many attaboys, you know, at a place like this where I'm kind of the outlier but are these people ever going to hear this from anyone else but me? And is you know, that's a little bit more of a privilege I almost see as it, as a, like, I, I'm i honored to be be that person for these, you know, these people and, and there is a self-flagellation aspect to it. It's like, yeah, it's like a little bit harder but I take a little bit more pride in that. It's like, look, this isn't cut out for me but that's what makes it more special. You know? <laughs> yeah, you mentioned a little bit about the internet or whatever, but uh, so you have a podcast of your own. Are, are you still doing that? I, I just looked, and it doesn't look like you had a new podcast since January. Is that something you're keeping up on here? Well, you know, once I heard that you were doing one, I thought I might just <laughs> get, get out the game. It's over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is done, right? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know how real we want to get about this, but yeah, I took, I did a, I had a podcast called Strangers on This Road that I did for two years, mm -hmm. and uh, I was pretty aggressive about it for the second year where I was going up. I was posting about twice a week on it, mm. um, and it's interviews with comedians and musicians and other interesting people, and it was loosely themed around the idea of travel and, you know, this idea that travel uh, completes us as human beings, and, you know, I didn't always uh, stick to that theme, you know, just followed where the conversation went and I had fairly famous people on because of my access to those people from mm -hmm. doing comedy you know I had Mark Marin on I had Tim Meadows from Friday Night Live on uh, and just uh, I don't want to like discourage you so early in your own podcasting I just I just couldn't it would never catch mm -hmm. I had people that listened to it but the numbers were always pretty low mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work to do a podcast there's the you know the gear and like the editing and the uploading and and just uh, after two years of it and really trying to push it and be consistent, it became a thing where I had to step back. It just felt way too much like work. And um, and I just took a step back from it for a while to, to figure out if I want to keep doing it. Like, what what is the... What is the reason behind it? Am I doing this because it's going to make me a famous comedian? You know, is my podcast going to become famous? I'm going to be on the Nerdist Network. I'm going to get money. and Or do I genuinely like doing it? And I actually just recently decided that it it is its own reward. I do genuinely like talking to people. I uh, I feel like I'm a pretty good interviewer. I feel like I'm a terrible interviewee. I feel like I've just been rambling and babbling like a moron. Um during this thing right now, but I feel like if I'm on the other side, kind of getting the questions out of the people, I do a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've just recently decided to, to 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 take it back up again. So hopefully I'll have some some more episodes up soon. 
Yeah, I, I do. I do think that you have to have an element of just self satisfaction with the work itself. It has to be its own reward. And you know, a lot of times when I record these things, I'm just glad that it's recorded and up somewhere. You know, because I, I talk to people that I just enjoy hearing from, and you know, that is its own reward for me because I, you know, I'm delusional enough to just keep bashing my head against the wall. Um, I didn't get to this modest place in my life, uh, you know, by uh, by waiting for other people to validate my. Uh, Experience. I'd, I'd be nowhere if I if I did that. Even even the little place I am now. So yeah, I definitely respect that. And you have had some very you know famous people on here. And you know I, I do hope you take a little bit of satisfaction from from being able to snag that. I haven't listened to all of them yet, but I'm excited to listen to you know Mark Marin and Tim Meadows and some of the other ones I don't know. So um, yeah, there's definitely an element of you just have to be like it's like I heard somebody who you know I can't remember who said this, but it's like you can't if you want to write a book, you have to just want to in 50 years know that that book exists and be satisfied with that because you're the only person that's going to care you know no matter how, how successful it is and even in the moment you know because there's books that are you know forgotten now that were like number one bestsellers at the time and the only person that's remembering them is the family of and the person who wrote it and it's like you are you satisfied that this is out because that has to be the ultimate thing even if it is temporarily successful or whatever so yeah no that's a great that's a great little quote i'm glad you told me that yeah you know there's just a thing with uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I do a lot. You know, uh, I, I could do more. Again, I do have that sort of Midwestern, like, work at the key kind of thing that I, I enjoy working. I obviously always feel like I could be doing a little bit more. But the podcast just felt like, again, it was like a lot of work for a little reward. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole element of being a comedian, too, where you just you feel like you're supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be tweeting jokes all the time. There's all this stuff that is not just going up on stage and being funny and writing a new hour and the sort of core elements of why I got into stand up, which is that, you know, writing material, performing it on stage, uh, that sort of connection. Uh, and so I think I just, I had a little bit of a, <laughs> a little bit of a like, why? Why am I doing this? This is not what I got into comedy for. Was to be forced into doing this <laughs> podcast. Uh, and then also, there's just the thing of there are a million podcasts too. It's, it's sort of a moment of, does the world really need my podcast? Mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, so I, you know, I'll admit it. There's you know, being an artist, there's a lot of up and down and sort of. Uh, self-questioning, you know, like, uh, why am I doing this? Is this a good idea? Why doesn't anybody listen to what I'm talking about? You know, that sort of stuff Mm -hmm. mixed with the inherent narcissism of my ideas are so important. They should be amplified through a microphone Mm -hmm. uh, and you should all pay to hear them. Uh, so it was just one of those moments where I just took the other view of like, Oh, maybe I, maybe I don't need to be in everybody's ears 24-7, you know? Yeah, yeah, and you, I mean, you're still being creative, you still have outlets that allow you to be heard in the world and satisfy that part, so I mean, if that's being satisfied, I don't I don't think that's a, a knock on, on anything, and you're right, there is a million podcasts out there, and if you don't if you don't love doing it, you better just get out now, because it's like the <laughs> the Wild West is, is closing fast, there's fences going up all over the <laughs> the trails where there were, were none before so it's it's definitely not in its infancy anymore so if, if you don't love doing it for the fact of doing it uh it, it probably wouldn't be the best thing to do but um anyway i uh think i've pretty much asked you most of the stuff i wanted to ask um i, I did want to ask you this before if you don't mind me asking if this is too personal um your last name is is a, is a hyphen and i think mm-hmm. i figured out that somewhere that, that you took your wife's name as a hyphen is that correct that is correct. How did you well, come to both, that? How did you come to that decision? Well, we both did. You I both mean, did. Uh, so you both yeah, have hyphenated both, names. Yeah, we both okay. have Alana Martin as there. Uh, you know, it just goes back to the same thing of uh, you know, she's not a possession of mine. Uh, if if she had wanted to just take my name and be very traditional, I'd be fine with that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but it's also it is a way for us to. And nothing against anyone who, any woman who kept her own name and didn't hyphenate or didn't take her husband's name when they got married. Everyone has their own reasoning behind that and why they do it. Uh, but, you know, our conversation about it was to, uh, it's a way of showing that this is a union of, of equals, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, 
you know, if the options, if the traditional options, the now traditional options are the woman takes the man's name or the woman, uh, it's all it's all about the woman. The woman has to do something, right? The mm-hmm. woman has to take take the man's name or she has to keep her own name or she can hyphenate, right? But the man doesn't do anything, right? The man traditionally just, his name doesn't change at all. Well, that doesn't really reflect an equal partnership, mm-hmm. you know? And so it was just a way, and it wasn't, a, we didn't think of this idea. We had some friends who had done it. Uh, we stole the idea from them. Uh, so we're not this clever. Uh, but when we saw them do it, we were like, oh, that's pretty awesome, you know? And I'm not that, you know, I was not that attached to my, my last name, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say that Matt Alano Martin is a lot easier to Google than Matt Martin. Mm-hmm. You know, so just put it that way. Sure. It was all a career move. That's what I'm telling you. It's yeah. all for the show business. It was you know? a cynical, uh, uh, I get it. Cynical, okay. big business. Yeah, I thought, <laughs> thought it sounded ethnic enough that sure. I might get some, some casting, yeah. you know, just from that. They might sure. think, well, maybe he's a, a, a 12th. Latino, you know. Um, so no, uh, that's why I just I think I feel like it's a it's a more accurate representation of what our relationship is, which is an equal partnership. Cool, yeah. awesome. Uh, well, this is going to be out on April eighth, uh, is my plan. Uh, now I know you guys are in the process of releasing uh, tickets and, and badges and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that point, will they all be available to purchase, or will you all the Everything yeah, yeah, yes, April 8th. Yeah, they should. Yeah, the, uh, not single show tickets, but all the badges will be up by then. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll have, we'll have announced the uh, the field of submission-level comics who were selected because that will go up April 1st. Uh, we might have to delay that a couple of days, so like April 3rd or 4th, but by the 8th it should be up. Okay, cool. Um, is, yeah. There any, yeah, is there anything else I didn't ask you about that you want to get in there or promote? or? No, I, I just feel like I rambled like a moron. I mean, if, <laughs> You know, if you can just make me sound cool, you know, it's, just, it's just so hard to make me sound cool. I uh, almost famous. Uh, so I guess, you know, limestonefest.com, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I just rambled like an idiot. I apologize. That's I ask open-ended questions for a reason. If it was all yes or no, it'd be a pretty short podcast. So. Yeah, but I could have been more focused. I don't know. I, th- I feel like I'm too comfortable with you because it's been a couple of years now uh-huh. that we've talked for the paper and stuff. I'm like, sure. oh, whatever, dude. You know, dude. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, dude. <laughs> you know, just fill it in. Yeah. Whatever, dude. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it was good talking to you. I'm glad we uh, hooked it up, and I'm looking forward to this year's festival for sure. It's it's always been a great time, and, and you guys put on a great show. So, Well, thank you. We, we work hard on it, and uh, we definitely have you know appreciated your support over the years, too. You're actually the first guy to ever write about the festival. The first really? year, I think you're the only newspaper other than our local newspaper right. who wrapped into it. But as far as uh, regionally, uh, you were definitely ahead of the curve. Well, cool. On like thinking, oh, this is cool. We should write about it. Definitely. Well, I, yeah, I look forward to it every year, and this year's no exception. So, uh, anyway, uh, it was good talking to you, man. Good talking to you, too, man. And I'll see you, uh, I guess, in the end. For sure, man. Yeah, take it easy. All right, you take it. Okay.